we're here with state championship coach Tara Seifert. Uh, Tara, thank you so much for joining the uh, AGB podcast. We're excited to have you on here. Uh, we're talking off screen a little bit. So much to dive into. So much is ap- applicable to our audience, everyone we're trying to reach between um, players, coaches, and athletes. And so I don't want to waste any time. Coach T, welcome to the podcast. Hey. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm honored to be here and I love to see the program that you guys are developing and how much you're going to help athletes, coaches, parents, everyone that's you know willing to be a part of this. Before we get going, I think it's worth noting to everybody, I, we don't know exactly when this is going to come out, but officially this is our first female guest on the HB podcast so you are <laughs> the mold, folks. welcome hopefully You're hopefully one up. of many to come oh right? man That's- one of many we have we have many more to come but we are excited to have you here for the first time and um uh jb i know you guys go back and uh jb's gonna lead this conversation but i was telling him last night good luck trying to lead it because i love talking <laughs> i love talking basketball i love talking hoops i plan on learning from you today and so uh, welcome to the show and i appreciate you coming on Oh, thank you. Excited to be here. Love it. Um, so quick overview, uh, kind of how I got introduced to, to Coach T. Uh, had the opportunity to work with her two years uh, in her program and, and see front and center what, it, what it's like um, to be a part of her program. Uh, got to be the hype man uh, and, and actually practice with the team, um, not just being on the sideline, was in their running scout team and um, learned so much uh, from you over those uh, those two years, Tara, and super excited to kind of apply that in this setting uh, going forward. And so the first thing just kind of want to get into is like quick overview, who is Tara Seifer, where are you from, where are you at uh, now, uh, for those of the watching that don't know you. Um, yeah, so long, long history of sports. Uh, I grew up in a huge family, had four brothers. We all played sports. I got beat on a lot because I was the youngest of six kids. Um, played four sports in high school and really gravita- gravitated towards basketball. That was my passion and put a lot of time in uh, in the off season. I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to Iowa State. So I played in the Big 12 in college and I was a part of a program that struggled my first two years and had a a great head coach, Bill Finley, who's still there, came my junior year and completely transformed the program. Uh, And that was really impactful, I think, in my life that I was at a I went to a school thinking I would get early opportunity, which I did, but we weren't very successful. So I dealt a lot with ups and downs and challenges. We didn't win many games and then saw a huge turnaround with a new coach and a team really believing um, in his style, his system. So we had a strong last two years, um, got NCAA tournament my senior year, first time in the history of the school. So that was kind of a big deal. Um, Thought about playing overseas, was tough. I'm a kind of a hometown kid, knew I'd struggle with being homesick. The WNBA was just starting at that time. So I do remember trying out for the Lynx (laughs) like 20 years ago and it was a huge tryout. Um, so long story short, uh, my career was kind of done that played in women's leagues. And I think I was working at a fitness center for a year and realized I really missed coaching and I wanted to get into coaching. So I started coaching high school basketball uh, in St. Paul for a season, coached one year at a division three college and then moved to the Southwest Metro, which was Chaska, Minnesota, and was fortunate uh, that the coach was about retiring. So my third year got the head job. And then was head coach for 16 years. Um, Had a great experience there, had lots of ups and downs. I was fortunate to have a lot of talented athletes come through. Um, 2021 was an awesome year. We went 18 and 0, and it was COVID, so it was a crazy year, but we won the state title. First title we've had at Chaska. Um, And then fast forward to today, I did step down from Chaska and I just got a new opportunity at Creighton Durham Hall, which is a large private school in St. Paul. And I, I got an assistant athletic director position along with the head coaching position. So um, most of my experience has been at the high school level. I love coaching student athletes. I'm a huge person on culture and positivity, um, but also trying to help student athletes get through ups and downs. And I will say, Dustin, you have no idea how much you brought to my team the last two years at Chaska. And um, no, he was really uh, just a highlight for the kids and kept everything positive, whether kids are up or down and uh, made it fun and brought great energy. And that's 
so important, I think, at any level, but really the high school level, you want to have fun with the kids and you want them to want to come to practice. So I've been really blessed to get to coach as long as I have and, you know, play for a long time and play at a high level. Um, but also understood it took a lot of work and a lot of dedication. And I had a lot of great coaches and teammates along the way. Yep. Love, love that. But lots of, lots of unpack there. Yeah. Um, awesome. Awesome career and uh, of, of um, things that you, you have done. And, and so I guess go, let's go back to playing the big 12. You said you started mm -hmm. off two seasons. Um, you know, they weren't the best. Take me through that player's mindset um, where, you know, I know you're you're giving it all. You want to be uh, an elite player. How do you yeah. um, bring that to everyone in the locker room? How do you turn, especially a college team where it's a little different than a high school team where every, you're, every, everyone's living together at your town, college, you got a mix of different people. How do you pull a locker room together and ultimately end up getting them to their first tournament appearance? Oh, yeah. Leave? It was a lot. And like you said, it was a lot of ups and downs. Um, my freshman year, I think they brought like nine, nine or 10 freshmen in. It was kind of like weed out the week. We had one of the worst mm -hmm. preseason conditionings I've ever been a part of. And um, so my first two years we battled, but just didn't have enough skill. Um, the coach was young, so they made a big coaching change. And that in itself was a huge transition for me because as a, a college player, you go to a college and you assume the coach is always going to be there. And you're very tight with your teammates. And then it does happen a lot. Coaches move around. And I think you're seeing that even more in college where there's nothing saying your coach is going to be there for four years when you're there. You hope so. Um, so I was pretty worried, disappointed, wasn't sure if I was going to stay. Uh, for me, I was fortunate. The guy that came in who's still there was uh, a, a player or a coach that was a player's coach, but always also helped the style of play. I was a good shooter. I was a transition player, uh, point guard, off guard. And just reading in the program where he came from, that's what they did. They were transition. They shot the ball a lot. Um, it was all about buying into the system, believing we could win. Um, so it was it was a tough couple of years, but very rewarding by my senior year that we were competing well and made the NCAA tournament. So it made a lot of that grind <laughs> worthwhile. Uh, but it, yeah. it taught me a lot about resilience, about having to believe in yourself, having faith in yourself and your teammates and sticking together. There was five of us that were seniors that started from that, I think, nine that finished all four years together and, you know, got the NCAA watch and, um, you know, have the banner that says our year on it. I always talk to the high school kids about getting a banner in your gym. Um, but, you know, a lot of blood, sweat and tears go into getting something like that and then just all the time you put in, especially collegiately as an athlete, it's really your job. Um, so, you know, it was a big process, but I, I think a lot of it was coming together as a team. I was a captain uh, my last year and a big piece of it was making sure everybody was on the same page, getting along and trying to stay positive because it's a grind. The basketball season's a grind. Absolutely. So look, talking about grinding and conditioning, and I think I, I remember that story if I, recall correctly you drove home immediately after that and you could physically couldn't get out of your yeah. car right your legs physically weren't working you had to get lifted out is that oh yeah and again i'm old so i mean we had a strength coach that was doing your power cleans your squats maxing out on everything all kinds of lunges and you gotta remember when i came out of high school we didn't have the weight rooms like they do now and the programs so a lot of us freshmen this was our first experience and he just crushed us so we got one weekend to drive home before the start of the season. And I literally couldn't get my legs out of my car. <laughs> I had like tears coming down. I look at my dad. I'm like, I don't know if I can make it. <laughs> um, but I did, right? You're not that old and yeah. survived. And, you know, we always talk about that's probably the best shape you're ever going to be in your life if you're a college athlete. You, you always strive to get back to that point, but you realize how conditioned you were and um, how hard you worked athletically. I love that. So for all our players out there that want to make that transition from high school to college, quickly talk about the, the difference of level of conditioning and just weight training and expectations and time commitment from being a high school athlete to being D1 Iowa State athlete. What, yeah, what's that think, difference like? Yeah, I think for any kid, it's a huge transition your freshman year, whether you're an athlete or not. But a lot of it is balancing your schedule. Uh, it's like a job and you have to 
you have to realize that when you go on, you're going to put a lot of hours in when it comes to your workouts. I, I do think colleges do a good job of helping structure the workouts and they have the strength coach and they have nutrition help now if you need it. Um, but you have to really, you know, take care of yourself and realize that you're trying to stay healthy and get in your best condition you can for the season because of that grind that's coming. So it's year round. Yeah. I remember lifting preseason, lifting during season, postseason. There's different goals depending on what part of the year you're in when it comes to collegiate sports. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what is one of your favorite playing memories at Iowa State? Uh, would you say it was being in a tournament or is there a specific memory that sticks out to you? Yeah, I, making the NCAA tournament was a big one. I know we had a big upset over Texas uh, my senior year when they were like number four. Mm -hmm. That was, yeah, horns down. <laughs> um, but, you know, we just had some big wins and just getting um, more consistency and competing in the Big 12. My first two years, we didn't. We struggled. We were at the bottom, you know, second to last of the conference. So to say you're in the upper half and competing every game was a big deal. And you guys know when you're playing in a bigger conference, it's so hard to play on the road. But it's a fun experience to play in different arenas and different crowds. And so I think one of the other prouder points was our attendance grew a lot. And I, I'm sure you two have never been to an Iowa State game, but they, to this day, average over 10,000 fans a game on the women's side, which is really amazing. And it's top three in the country. So, you know, winning and the positivity and young girls that want to be a part of it, uh, the success they've had has really grown the game and the excitement for women's basketball. And you guys probably followed this last season, not Iowa State, but Iowa, the following they had with Caitlin Clark and all of her success and how many little girls, you know, are dying for her autograph. So um, I think the women's game has really grown and it's exciting. Absolutely. The college game is, is elevating. And I, I know this next season, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what LSU brings to the table. There's just a lot of dynamics across college basketball. Oh, yeah. And getting into the WNBA, too, it just – it seems like it just keeps getting bigger, bigger, and better, better. Uh, yeah. So. You mentioned LSU and you miss, mentioned Caitlin Clark. So, you know, not from a, not from a tabloid perspective, but really just from a coach perspective and a, and a fan of the game. I'm curious to know your thoughts of that interaction between Reese and Clark and the whole, you know, was she going too far with the bragging and that kind of thing? I, I, I have some thoughts, but I'm interested in yours. <laughs> You know, I go, I went back and forth on a little bit um, and I don't know who else is going to watch this. I'm amazed by Caitlin Clark, but she's also a player that's had to do a lot of work with her personality and her, um, you know, they hired somebody to work with her specifically this last year. And a lot of it was with her temper and mm -hmm. being a better teammate um, because she's so competitive. And I've always said with athletes, your top athletes are sometimes your most emotional players. Mm -hmm. because they're so competitive and they get so into the game. If you can learn to channel it, it's great. But I tell parents that all the time, they get frustrated at the youth level, like, oh, I just got to figure it out. And even my own son, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. just the disappointment and frustration or you're spiking the ball. And uh, it's, it's good to have emotion because that means you care yeah. and you're so competitive. And so it, when I first watched her do it, I thought, okay, well, she won. They're, they're winning, right? And Caitlin Clark, somebody that's taunted players in the past, that's not out of her. So it was a little bit of a taste of her own medicine. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, from a coaching standpoint, I would not have been happy if that was my player. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of the coach where I try to stay calm. I try not to blow up. Am I perfect? No. But I think your leader leads by example and your kids are mm -hmm. going to follow. So I look at Kim Milkey a little bit and she's crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> she sideline. She's so so good, but she's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's up and down. Um, so they see that out of their coach too sometimes. Um, but, you know, I ultimately thought these are two, two extremely competitive, ex extremely talented players that were at a peak level of competition. And I think that, you know, LSU player, it is a huge deal. They want a national title, right? Mm -hmm. Like she wanted to own it. We, we got yeah. it done. So um, I think it got overblown for sure, but it didn't come across real respectful. And some people just jumped in late and had no idea what the whole situation, right? Like they hadn't yeah. followed the players the whole year. So there's a lot more behind all of it than I think what people saw as far as the end result. Yeah. 
um, you know, my thing, I just have to get off my chest, you know, as, yeah. as a father, you know, I have mm -hmm. a, I have a son and I have a daughter yeah. and I've spent every, every bit as much time coaching female basketball as I have male basketball. And for me, anyone who remembers from AGB, I would never refer to them as, as boys or girls. I just say athletes, athletes, yeah. athletes, and athletes have a certain, uh, demeanor. There's a certain thing that we do. There's a, there's a way that we approach the game. And a lot of times when fans are watching athletes play, they celebrate that swagger sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was just bothered by the double standard and the like overreaction to, to swag. I mean, you either like it or you don't as a fan base is how I right. look at it. And I've seen people, you know, I, you know, Steph Curry does night, night and shimmies and all that stuff. And it's fun and it's celebrated and, and it adds some lure to the game. And we're always talking about how the females uh, need to get paid more. And the answer to the not getting paid more is, well, there's not as much fan engagement. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Reese and Clark just added some fan engagement. In Big fact, time. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. I think their numbers were every bit as good, if not better, than the men's final four. I think they had more following than the men did yeah. this year. Yep. Right. So let's not let's not create that double standard. That's those are my thoughts. I think if if you're going to like it in one place, like it in all places, because we're at. Yeah. It. I agree. I agree. 100%. Yeah. To me, it's double standard. One hundred percent. You can't celebrate one sport and not the other. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. So. Uh, Quickly before jumping over to the coaching uh, side of things, um, why basketball, Coach T? Has it always been basketball? You just you had a basketball in your hand as a little kid, and um, it's just – it's been in your blood or – uh, yeah. Why basketball? yeah, I think in my blood, I had older brothers that played, um, one that played collegiately. And I knew, I just, you know, he put a lot of time in and I saw his commitment to it. And just, um, you know, it's a fun sport. It's a uh, – action sport so it's fun to watch it's fast pace um good crowds um you know i think i just fell in love with it playing it at a young age and i love the competitiveness of it you know i grew up playing with the boys so that was fun and taking some knocks but i think it made me tougher because of it um but yeah i just enjoyed watching it enjoyed playing it from a, from a young age so i think the love for that just grew and then uh, I do remember watching Don Staley. She's a couple years older than me. So love watching her in college play as a, a good point guard. And, you know, it was fun to start seeing a lot of the um, attention, like after the women's national team, what was that? 90, 92. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it, it's grown a lot. And it just, it was fun for me to see, Hey, I have opportunities beyond high school to play. And, you know, I started seeing more female coaches and uh, professional players. So I was like, you might as well try it and do the best you can. And I was fortunate to, like I said, get an education out of it and get to continue to do it as a, as a job. Love it. So, okay, perfect transition. Just as all of us players, whether we go, go, go play professionally or not, the game at some point is going to come to an end. And so mm -hmm. you chose to transition from playing into coaching. Um, just because you're a great player, it doesn't mean you're going to be a great coach. Uh, talk us through those early years of, of Chaska. Um, you, had, you had a three-year buffer when you got there to kind of learn a little bit. Um, but yeah. what was it like being a, a head head basketball coach? Um, yeah, I think I had to early on. I really enjoyed it, but I was so used to playing at a Division One level that I had to step back a little bit and think, oh, my gosh, some of these kids are like 14 in my program, and I'm expecting them to read a change of defense and know a zone and – um, you know, so I had some early frustrations and I had kids that they're there to be a part of the team. You know, I was always wanting to be the best player, um, wanted to be a starter. I wanted to whatever, be the go-to kid. And so I had a hard time initially <laughs> sometimes coaching those kids that were just there for fun or didn't really care. But I soon learned the importance of a program, you know, with you, you're trying to have four levels of, of teams and, you want kids to have a good experience. And I don't think I understood early on the importance of just being a part of a program, how much that helps young, young athletes and just young individuals and everything they learn from being a part of the team. Um, so I think I early coached freshmen and realized I really want to get up to the varsity level because <laughs> I enjoyed coaching the more athletic kids and more competitive. Um, I tell one story from years ago where I was trying to put in a, 
um, a man man press with my ninth grade team. And I had a big team that year. So I was spending time where kids should be thinking. I'm telling the girls, you all need to be listening because I my biggest pet peeve is having to repeat everything I just said. Right. So I get off to the side of the court and one of the girls looks at me and says, did you get highlights, Coach T? <laughs> she was wondering about my hair. Had heard nothing about what I was teaching, and I sat here with my mouth at the floor. And I thought, "Oh my gosh, I'm not coach. You know, I'm not in college anymore. <laughs> you know, girls, I'm dealing with you." So I finally just I laughed. I didn't know whether to be mad or laugh about it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to go back to the basics and um, just enjoy these kids that want to be a part of this and try to be positive and try to teach them and, and get them to understand that we got to compete, too. So it was, I think, going back to a lot of the fundamentals early on and then realizing I really want to work with with probably the varsity kids eventually. But it, it did help me to coach at different levels. Yeah. I, I want to tell a story about something similar to that because I think it's I think it's so important that that we might that we're we realize that those can be like a spring of fresh water to just yes. be reminded that sport is fun. It yeah. is fun, and when you're ultra competitive like this and, and you played at a high level, sometimes if we're honest, we forget that. But yeah. I remember you know coaching at at Elgin Academy, which was not a a athletic school. Those kids they had to take uh, they had to play on a team for gym credit. Okay. So we had kids that were just coming out to get gym credit. And there was one girl on the team who's, who's that's why she was there. And we were, it was actually a very close game. Sure. It was like 12 to 12, but it was a very close game. And I, and I put her in the game and she got a rebound underneath the basket in like a 30 seconds left in the game sort of situation. And she didn't know what to do with it. She ne- And she literally rolled it under her legs. <laughs> <laughs> just to get rid of it but she rolled it under her legs to someone who was wide open and they put it in for a game winner and the place oh, went crazy so great. and it was just so much fun and I was sitting there trying to coach like that situation and I just was reminded that sometimes this game is just a game you know yeah. so I think we can learn from each other but I I understand both sides of that because that can be hard to do yeah yeah and, but you know I think over the years too I learned like you know the importance of trying to find minutes maybe for the kids that have put the time in you know that are seniors that you're not going to cut but trying to find moments where you can get get them some time or just so they feel valued you know which i think is another thing that's really tough as coaches is how do you make the 15th player on your varsity team feel like they're really a part of this team so i mean that's always something you're working on right is your team dynamics and um the value of your kids on your team and realizing their importance whether they get a lot of minutes or not you used the word use the word program earlier coach and then in your introduction you were being very humble and you said that you were fortunate enough to have lots of good kids come in but um i, I believe that. yeah i'm <laughs> sure but i'm sure that had something to do with program so can you talk to our young coaches about the importance of program from top to bottom and how that leads to players coming in um ready yeah. to learn from the older players that are there you know, um, it can be different depending on what school you're at. I'm learning that right now at being at a private school, but being at a larger public school, my big focus early on was our youth association. And so getting the right people in place, getting um, evaluations of these kids, getting camps in the summers. And Justin probably went, did you come to camp? I can't remember if you did last summer or not. Yeah, but it, it's a lot of a lot of fun when you have those kids in your community that, that you're offering reasonable camps, you have your high school kids a part of it so that they start seeing these high school kids and realize I want to play high school basketball someday. And you know what? They were at camp. You know, Jen was there today and she's the top scorer on the team. And she was showing me how to shoot the basketball and she helped coach my team this you know day at camp. So we worked a lot on getting camp scheduled, making sure the high school kids are working, you know, so they're learning along the way too. Uh, you can tell who your best leaders are based on running a youth camp <laughs> with your high school kids. Yeah. Who wants to teach them? Who's involved? Who's being vocal? Um, so those are some of the, the, the leadership stuff we did. Um, and then just trying to incorporate, even though we have four levels of basketball, you know, we would at practice have at least two levels together warming up every day so that they're there, they're supporting each other at the games. Um, You do a banquet for all the kids at the end of the season, but making sure that they feel their team is very valued, even though they might be the ninth grade team trying to get up to varsity. 
So, you know, having good coaches in place that really emphasize that if the, what's your goal, are you wanting to get to the varsity level, but let's be the best freshman team we can be this year. Let's see how well we can progress as a team. And then having those small, you know, check-ins to see how things are going, I think is important too. That's good stuff. Love it. So you start to sprinkle in these different aspects. You're building the program mm -hmm. and take us through – that state championship season, and as you alluded to, is kind of a weird season um, yeah. dealing with, with COVID, actually only playing a total of 18 games. Um, but when undefeated that season, um, mm -hmm. yeah, take us through it. That's, that's a dream, right? That's what everyone's trying to build to. You play to win the game ultimately. There's only one team yeah. at the end of each division. Yep. There's very few teams that end on a win, right? Only your state championship teams or maybe your consolation winners. Um, so that's a, a experience I hadn't had before where we won the state championship, let alone we're undefeated. Um, and we knew we had a talented team. It was a very, um, the top four teams were very strong in the state that year. And just to get to state is a big deal. And we always are in a tough section too. But because of COVID, we had a lot of rules and regulations, which was such a weird year for everyone, right? Let alone the kids being out of school. So I, I do think it helped kids really want to be a part of a team. And we talk about that year. I never once had a practice where kids don't want to be there because I think they felt so isolated without being in school that they were just dying to get back with their friends and do something active together. For sure. Uh, but it was weird. We were wearing masks every day. Uh, we weren't supposed to have contact with the players as coaches or always be masked if we did. Um, and then if a case would hit, your whole team would quarantine for two weeks. And so uh, we were fortunate. And then we had a case hit right before sections started. So we missed our last, was it six games? Five games. And long story short, had her case hit the day after, we would have missed the postseason completely. So our first day back was our first section game. So it had been like, I don't know, 10 days since we could practice. And I'm panicking as a coach because I'm like, okay, great. We're a good team, but we haven't been able to do drills together or anything to prepare. And thank goodness we were a high seed. So we ended up winning our first game, but we did not look great. It was pretty rusty, right? Uh, but I think because we got games taken away and almost lost our entire season, it gave us an extra drive to don't take things for granted. And to say, you know what, if we can really put it together, we can do something special here. So um, along with that challenge is I don't think we got the best seed we should have because the seeding was different that year. So we ended up playing the top team in the semifinals, which was Hopkins High School. They were the number one team in the country. They had won 78 games straight. So we played them in the semis and I'll be, you know, it was a great game. My kids played unbelievable. Um, I kept telling them, you got to believe you can do it. All the pressure's on the other team. And honestly, they believed in themselves more than I did <laughs> because we were playing keep away the last two minutes of the game. And I never thought we'd be in a situation against a team that was that good. So we broke their 78 game winning streak and we upset the number one team in the country. And then we had to play a Rosemont team that was kind of a Cinderella story team. And they were completely opposite style. They were slow it down, grind it out, whereas Hopkins was a run and gun and transition. So I was completely nervous about that because we only had one day to prepare for that championship game. So it came right down to the wire. Um, and we ran an sideline out of bounds play for a backdoor cut. And the kid made the perfect pass to her teammate to score the winning basket. They heaved a half quarter and missed. And so we won by two points to win the state awesome. championship. So it was very dramatic. <laughs> that is awesome. um, and it was just very different dramatic. because of the COVID stuff, you know, but it made it kind of special for our community because everybody was watching. We had all the local restaurants and bars streaming our game. Uh, people were having garage parties for us because they couldn't go. They limited how many tickets. Um, so it was something the community really looked forward to when everybody was really bummed out about COVID. So it was a fun, really fun experience for the kids. But yeah, it was one of those um, things as a coach that before that moment, I don't know if I could ever say that I had a moment where it was more exciting to be a coach than a player. Because as an athlete, you just miss playing, right? Like I'm always like, there's nothing like playing was. 
but in that moment to watch the kids succeed and to win the title through all the adversity we had had was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. I used to get kind of uh, emotional talking about it because I'm like, holy buckets that we just did it. These girls actually accomplished what they set their minds out to do. I think we should stop really quick and just quickly give a shout out to anybody who was leading during that year. If you were leading any people <laughs> during COVID, you deserve a shout out. Like, I mean, that was just a crazy time and it tested us as human beings because we were tested ourselves. We were afraid ourselves. We were uh, unsure of what was going on around us ourselves, yeah. but we still knew that our responsibility was to lead other people and try to hide that as much as we possibly could. Yeah. Um, so, with, so with that, I have this question for you. So I'm, I'm putting on my coach hat. Yeah. And I've been in those seatings. I, yeah. I've, I've, I've clicked on that button and I'm waiting for that seat. <laughs> and I have been there where I know I am upset with the seat that I have. Yes. And I know that I can't show my players. So so talk us through that as a coach. Really, what was your thoughts when you saw that? Team? You know, it, it was crazy that year because typically you, you know, vote in and you see everybody else's vote. And they really didn't do it that way that year. And I think they did more of a um, they set it kind of like two separate brackets. And our first round game in state, you know, the team we were playing, I think, had one loss maybe on the season, they could have been arguing for the top seed. So the top three teams are all so competitive. Um, and, you know, I just looked at the kids and I'm like, you know what? You can sit here and complain that we weren't the top seed, or you can take this as a challenge and prove them that they're wrong. You know, but I said, regardless, you got to win games to win the state championship. So no matter who you got to go through, you got to put your three best games together and get it done. And I, and I do think it, one thing that worked in our favor is we were supposed to play Hopkins, the top team that we upset earlier in the season. And because of COVID, they had a week where they didn't play. So they didn't see us during the year like they were supposed to. They were so set on that championship that I think they overlooked us a little bit too. And um, we shot well and we just, every time they scored, we came right back at them. And so I don't think they were ready for us <laughs> to be as good as we were that night. And they were so focused to get to the next game that I think it helped us. That's awesome. Yeah. But I think we used it as motivation. Um, and like I said, because of it being COVID um, and take, you know, things getting taken from you, it's like, you just got to go out and do what you can. Either of you ever seen that movie soul, the Disney movie with the, the, the guy that plays the piano. And yeah. like, um, I have not. I've always wanted to see that movie, but yeah. Oh my god! So okay, so so just really quick, one clip from that that movie where he finally gets his dream. Right, he wanted he wants to be yeah. a jazz musician. He gets a chance to be a jazz musician, and then he leaves the club, and he goes, "That's all." So as a person who's never won a state championship as a coach, always wanted to, it what's that feeling like afterwards? Is it like ah? Uh, or is it like, this is everything that I thought it was going to be? It's pretty amazing. Um, and I, the coaches, I think you get it the most because especially if you've coached for a while, like I coached, um, it was like my 15th, 14th year that we finally got the title And my first year coaching and third, we made the state tournament, but didn't get to the championship. I think we finished third and fourth. And I was very fortunate to come into a lot of talent. I thought, wow, this is great. We're going to get back. Well, it took us 10 years to get back to the state tournament and we ended up winning it. But it's like you don't take it for granted as a coach because you know how hard it is to get there. And the kids were thrilled and it was amazing. Um, but I think a lot of them, it's, it's hitting them now, like after they've graduated and they look back and they watch the state tournament now and realize that was us. We did this or we'll do a reunion in 10 years, you know, and highlight that team. Um, and they'll show their kids someday that state title, you know, because we talk about banners. But as a player in high school, I don't think you really get it until maybe you're older and have your own kids or maybe you're coaching somewhere. Um, so, yeah, it, it was really amazing. And um, you're just so proud of the kids. That's the part that was so fun for me is you're thrilled for your coaching staff. You're so excited for the girls and your entire program because it really represents your program when you win a title. It's awesome. I love it. So ultimate program accomplishment, state title. Yeah. Um, fast forward two more seasons there. Uh, you get your 300th coaching win, mm. um, personal accomplishment. Take us through through that. That's a lot of wins, a lot of games. Um, was that a milestone that um, you had coming into coaching in any way? Did, did that mean something to you? 300 uh, wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
what is that coach? Uh, honestly, I, it, it isn't a big milestone to me. It's really cool to hear. It makes me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> like how long has she been coaching? Um, <laughs> so it, it was fun to see. And yeah, it sounds like a big number. I get it. Um, but it, it, to me, it, it, I would have given that back last year to get to the state tournaments with those kids. We finished, we finished 27 and two and they were amazing, but it was disappointing, you know, not to get one more week of basketball. So it, yeah, for me, it's very rewarding, but I've never been the coach of counting how many wins I've had and, um, you know, I just feel, like I said, I feel fortunate that I've coached as long as I have and have had the talent to help get the success and wins and have kids that have really bought into the program. Not that. to mention amazing coaches, too, because you're only as good as your coaching staff. I, I do believe that. Uh, I love your humility, your harmonious coach. <laughs> and in my opinion, that's what makes a great coach a great coach. Well, um, Rick talks yeah. about this all the time. It's not who you are. It's the experience you provide. And you are that um, to a T. And oh, appreciate that, that kind of leads me into this, this next thing. One, one thing that I took away from um, being close with you for two years and, and watching you work with the program is your emphasis on culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we look at those two, two, those two seasons um, and like from a coaching staff, the preparedness from a culture and the conversations that we had Total, I would say totally different. And I think the locker rooms were impacted that way. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that you, you do all, always is like those John Gordon books yeah. um, in the summer. So talk, talk me through, I um, mean, talk about program, but why is culture so important to you? And why do you always make such an emphasis to every team um, about it? Yeah, I, I think with the amount of years I've coached, when I look about what have been your special teams or what has helped teams succeed, it's not always the talent, but those kids within, and like I said, how their chemistry develops during the year, are they willing to be a great teammate? Are they willing to fill their role on the team? And the, the years that you have those kids that are really dedicated and are, as I always say, all in, um, are probably your most rewarding teams and they probably succeed above your expectations. Um, and so we talk a lot about in either the summer or the fall, I've always done a book, I shouldn't say always, the last five years for sure I have. And I tell you what, those have been years that have ramped up with this group. I knew we had talent coming, but you're always gonna have challenges with kids um, with wanting more playing time, or are they okay with the role? Um, are they okay with the role even if their parents aren't okay with the role that they've been asked to do? And so doing that John Gordon book or any kind of leadership book, I think helps address some of those questions and challenges that are going to occur during the season. And we have discussions. So I, I try to set up where every week the kids read a couple chapters and then I will text or email out questions. So we have discussions and it's a great way to involve not only returners, but some of your younger kids that maybe haven't even thought about what they're going to encounter during the season. Who can I go to to talk and confide in? Um, and I always think too, I hope this helps the kids understand your coaches are approachable. Like we're spending this time to develop the culture and go through these questions. And I want to hear why you play, what, what's your passion? Why are you here? Why am I, you know, why do I coach? And what are we trying to do as a team? What are the goals with this team? And then let them get to know each other and build that relationship together and set those goals together as a team. You're still going to have ups and downs, but I think addressing things early and then having this book to reflect back on if you need to on Saturday practice or um, in the locker room after a tough game and go back to, you know, we talked about this before the season. Can we get through it? What do we need to work on? Why are we struggling right now? Um, and it's just that communication piece. You can never over communicate to a team. And I, I think especially on the girls' side, the emotional piece is really important. And girls want to be heard. They want to feel cared for. Um, my joke between girls and boys, I also coach fifth grade boys basketball, <laughs> is boys have to play good to feel good. Uh, girls have to feel good to play good. So it's, you know, you hear it, but it's very true. And if you can get girls emotionally together and feeling positive, they're going to play their hearts out for you. And boys, if their skills are good and their, their game's feeling good, they're going to come together and play well together, too. 
Um, and so I think the communication piece is really important with the team, even especially prior to the season. It doesn't make it perfect, but it helps lead into it and start thinking about what are some of those challenges or maybe what do we have? I know last year we focused a lot on what went wrong last year. What do we need to do better? And what were some of the negatives that we needed to overcome and how do we um, prevent some negativity from creeping in this year? And what are we going to do if it does come in? So uh, it's kind of those hard questions. And then you're trying to get kids to really want to be held accountable, you know, because sometimes it's hard. Uh, you're 14 and 15. You're not very mature yet. You might be really competitive. But can you handle when the seniors telling you you're doing something wrong? And senior, can you talk? nicely enough to a freshman or sophomore who might be battling for your position to help them and grow them. Can you be mature enough to be a leader to do that? So some of those tough questions uh, early on, I think really help you during the season. Coach, have you ever had talent that doesn't buy in? Yes. <laughs> what, what do we do there? Because that, that can be the, one of the most challenging moments as a coach. You've got this book, you've got this culture, you've got this energy, you know, it's going to help. Um, but you know, let's be honest. If it's someone who isn't super productive, that isn't responding to us, that's not that challenging. We know what to do with that yep. player, but that player that really can move the needle for us from a yep. productive standpoint that isn't responding, talk to our coaches, tell us, tell us how to handle that. Yeah, I, like I said, I think when I think back years ago, I had a kid that was probably division one talent that really struggled with her ego and attitude, especially if she wasn't playing up to her potential. Um, I did not do the book that year. I did not prepare the team like I should have. And it was a struggle. Uh, we definitely ended up finishing our season before we should have. Um, I think, you know, it's some of that you're going to have to take that individual one-on-one uh, -on -one and challenge them with some of those questions. Like, are you going to be okay being the one that holds back the team because you can't sacrifice what we're asking you to do? Or you're choosing to be selfish, hmm. um, you know, within your teammates and you're looked upon as a leader here. Um, and so, you know, they have to realize they do have such a big impact on the team and you're not going to be perfect, but you have to grow and adjust I think as a season goes on, and if you're not seeing those changes, it's it's communication individually with that player and pointing out some tough things. <laughs> I think that's so huge. I, I don't know if you guys caught that, but that's so important. Like when you went to challenge that athlete, you asked them the question about if they're going to be okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, just think about the way you frame that, where, you know, some of us who are less responsible, we might knee jerk. And we, and the way we respond to that is to tell them that they're not okay. You're yeah. going to be upset. You're going to be, you know, you're going to let us down, you know, that kind of thing. And instead of saying, Hey, are you going to be okay? Yeah. With, if, if it turns out this way, there's so much care in that approach. I love that. Yeah. And I think um, we talk a lot when we talk about culture, about um, every year we talk to the team about what does this team want to be known for when someone comes to watch us play or observes us in the community or is at a basketball camp that we're hosting? Uh, how do we want to be perceived? You know, and a lot of the times the kids will be like, we want to be the team that has great effort, that hustles all the time, that's respectful, you know. So you kind of let the kids dictate and say, okay, if that's what you want to be known for. What are the things we need to do to show that, you know, day in and day out? And how do you hold each other accountable to those things so that, you know, you're not that t player that looks great on the court, but you're a jerk to everybody at school the next day, or you're arrogant and, you know, you're talking trash or, um, so some of those things to think about and make it bigger just than that person. Like this is our whole program. We've got 40 kids here and we go to schools every week and play against other teams. And I say, let's look at some of the other schools we play. What do you think about when we play this team? You know, what do you think they're known for? And it starts them thinking about, yeah, I guess that's true. When we play them, they rebound really well, or they look really sloppy. They come in and, you know, uh, they all want to look like individuals or, so just kind of putting those questions out there to them early and say, you know, we have to buy into this, but every day it's your responsibility now because you're part of this program and you have to take pride in it. And you should go home and share this with your parents too. This is how we want to be perceived. And this is our culture. I love it. I love it. There's no buy-in like the buy-in that comes organically from them. Yes. You know? 
So, so you let that. them kind of set the standard and then it's your job to try to hold them accountable to it. And sometimes that's hard when you have to call kids out. But the sooner you do or the sooner you're aware of it, um, as they say, nip things in the bud early so that it doesn't become this huge situation. And jumping in from a player's perspective yeah. um, and experiencing a coach that one is taking the time to kind of check you, hold you accountable, that like getting that lens of, of like, oh, this person cares about me mm -hmm. um, bigger than just my role. And so that leads me into like what I want to talk to. Uh, caring is, is huge within the AGB mentality. It's, it's step number one um, to unlocking that confidence. And so I kind of want to talk about it in a couple, couple different ways, but like first and foremost to our coaches out there, talk to us about the importance of letting your parent, your players see how much you care. Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, you know, a lot of college clinics and courses you can take right now is kind of know your why, why do you coach and why is it important to you? If you're a coach, you're only, all you care about is wins and losses. Your kids are going to feel that and sense that right away. And you're going to have challenges. I mean, you have to really care about what you're doing. It's true with anything in life, right? If you have a passion for it, it's going to show. But in sports, uh, it, so much of it is about the care of the kids and helping them pr progress. And you want them to succeed, right? Um, but it can't be just about how many wins they have on the season. And so once they feel that, I think a lot of it's communication, but a lot of it's seeing your consistency as a coach and that you're giving them not only constructive criticism, but you're also rewarding them and you're also giving them a lot of encouragement um, and letting them know the good things they're doing. They're going to feel cared for as a player and I, they're going to play harder for you. You know, you have some coaches where they have a love hate relationship. But a lot of those coaches, even if they're yellers, as long as they're reinforcing and pointing out the good things that kids do, they're going to know they're cared for. Um, so it's really important to care and for for the athletes to feel cared for. They're going to, you know, they're going to play their best for you if they know that you care about them. Is there a time? Go ahead. Well, first of all, before I say anything else, can we just give a quick shout out to that beautiful view behind you, JB? It's changed as we started. <laughs> hey, shout out it to was Kyle. daytime. And I looked at you a few minutes ago. I'm like, man, the light's bouncing right off of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. Uh, no, and I didn't want to cut you off, JB. I told you this is going to be hard for me to keep my mouth shut. I love talking to you <laughs> in basketball, but go ahead. Um, Just kind of talking about do you think it's possible for a player to feel like you care if you don't take the time to build that relationship above and beyond practice time, game time? Like, I will say ever since I've been doing more of the culture, the book, um, I feel like the effort has been really good out of my team and it just helps build that rapport even amongst your teammates. Um, when you are having those discussions about your program, the importance and why they're a part of it, um, I think that's a huge buy-in for the kids. And I think it shows if you're willing to take that time to do it, that's part of that carrying piece. So I would encourage any coach uh, preseason pre wise to, to do those, you know, ask some tough questions, find out why they're there, what are their goals, but also those follow-ups. And you saw this last year. JB, that we did a lot on Saturday mornings and my assistant coach did not <laughs> get so mad because like, why are we talking again? And I'm like, well, you don't get it. If we have issues, we may not even know it, but we got to touch base with the kids and see where everybody's at. And if there's anything we need to talk about, because kids have a hard time enough approaching a coach, right? But if you don't bring things up and give them opportunities a lot of that stuff can build too. If you wait to and only have one conversation during the year or don't go back and touch base on what we've talked about. So I, yeah, you have I, to open those doors or at least start the conversation with the kids. The I'm, I'm so happy you brought up those Saturdays. That was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about just from yeah. a, an observer standpoint, not only talking about culture and it's important, but intentionally carving out practice time, which some players and even like, go to a business setting, some business owners carving out work time 
to engage in relationship building in, in yeah. your roles outside of out of playing or work like why is that so important for your team for your company to use like resource time or practice time like what what is it about it versus like hey here's a here read this chapter we'll talk about it over text or email why is it important to actually sacrifice um practice it's time? all about showing you care you know if you're even in a business it's like if my boss is willing to take time to set up this meeting to count you know have a conversation even if it's hard about what's not going well or just to give shout outs um, you feel cared for as an employee, like that's a better setting to work in a if, you know business like that. Um, so it doesn't matter what team you're on, that whole care piece is huge and that you've set aside the time to really communicate that. So the, what I was wondering is, is there a time when because you care, you have to let someone go? Would you say yeah. that or would you say it's over and over again? Like, I, I, I don't I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I am a Christian mm -hmm. and I like to I like to talk about it openly, but I, I don't think that everyone has to be. But I am. And there's a verse in the Bible that talks about um, that, you know, the Lord forgives you 70 times seven, which is basically the Bible's way of saying just over and over and over and over again. He's forgiven us and he kind of calls on us to do the same. So a lot of times as a coach, especially an A.D., at a Christian college, my coaches will come to me and that's what I tell them. I, I give them that Bible verse that mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're supposed to forgive over and over again. What would you say, coach? Is there a time when it's like, hey, I've tried as much as I can with player X and it's just not working? I think what you see a lot of times, and this isn't, not all the time, but I do think if you have things set up and they know you care and you're pointing out maybe the negativity and how you're being a cancer on the team, a lot of times that person almost pulls himself out of the situation because they're not happy. They haven't bought in. They don't like how things feel. They feel like, you know, they've been outed um, and you keep reinforcing, no, we want, you know, we want you to do this. Uh, and, and it's happened before where, you know, I, I can't be a part of it anymore. And so I feel like, yes, you continually encourage them it'd have to be pretty serious for me to kick somebody off. You know, I would, if it was a major violation on the team, but I do, I have had a couple of times where you, you know, maybe the player decides as the season starts, they're not going to play. They're, they don't think they can handle it without playing enough. Or I've been honest about this is going to be your role. Can you handle that and still be a positive uh, force for us and be encouraging, supportive to your teammates, knowing that you may not see the floor. And I've had kids that can handle it. And kids that couldn't, kids that tried during the season and some kids that said, you know, I don't think I'm going to come out this year because it's going to be too hard. And I respect that from them yeah. because yeah. if you're not going to have any fun and it's going to be a huge battle to, to not get on the floor, then it's probably an okay decision for you not to play. I love that. Which one of you brilliant uh, human beings is responsible for, for Benergy? Uh, that, That's JV. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we, got a, we got a documentary coming about that. Shout out to the uh, men. I mean, it, it originated, it molded between Minnesota Fury and Chaska uh, girls basketball. Oh, that was awesome. Started there, but brought it. Um, Chaska 100% bought it. I mean, shout out to, to this hype hawk here. Yeah, I mean, the hype they hawk. Awesome. Everything that uh, we were feeding them, those girls were 100% bought in um, to it. And it, the hustle stats was like Benergy was a part of that, uh, a really cool thing that I got to take from Lakes High School. Shout out Coach Schneider, um, something he did for us when I was in high school. Got to bring it out um, to Chaska, and it was, you know, it's so fun. And I, I think the team enjoyed it, something that we got oh, to do on a weekly basis, give out their little certificates. And yeah, it was just fun because it's those stats that you don't see in the stat line, right? The deflections, the hustle plays, the charges. All Lord the little does. things that you ask kids to do, right? That they're not going to get credit for um, in the newspaper or, you know. So Justin did a great job of giving other areas for kids to focus on that maybe don't get to play all the time. Um, and it it was just a fun extra thing to do. I love it because it, it, it personifies a role. 
you yes. know, that even if you're not in the game, you're still a part of this team. You have a role to play. So if if my role is to rebound and score and your role is to pass and shoot and then your role is to cheer. And, you know, what I mean, it's it's still part of the team and you're either going to oh, do yeah. it to the best of your ability or not. I love it. Yeah. And I think this last year we had one of the best benches we've ever had. And we had kids from the lower level. Find us in the stands every game, home or away. And you don't get that every year, right? But um, they were excited and they wanted to, to be there. And in their minds, they're thinking, we want this when we're varsity players. Yes, you know, so. we want the younger kids to cheer for us too. So it was fun. 100%. I, one, of, um, one of the quotes I wanted to pull from the Power of Positive team that we used this last year, um, or two of them, and I think you embodied it perfectly, but like one, difficult conversations don't need to be difficult. And then two, it's not okay to be moody. I feel like we brought both of those heavy into this year. Mm -hmm. um, and so talk to me about what those meant to, to you, how we kind of used that this year and, and kept at it on a Saturday, like a weekly basis, which to all our coaches out there, business owners, like just because you have a, a quarter kickoff a year kickoff, like you can't talk to the team again three, four months on the road at the end of the season. Like it, it's too late. Like it needs to be, if not daily, weekly. Like, and, and mm -hmm. so talk, yeah. How, how did we use that? Like those kind of, Well, I think um, we had had a season before where you could tell it bothered the kids. We had some seniors that really struggled with their role on the team. I take a big portion of, um, you know, things not going perfectly. I'll be the first one to say, if the team doesn't succeed, I'm going to blame myself first and see what can we do? What can we improve on? And so I think as a coaching staff, we didn't like how things felt at times. And then after the season, I do postseason meetings with the kids. We talk about what they want to improve on, what we see for them, and then also feedback on coaches, how they felt the season went. And I want them to feel okay sharing because we want to get better as a staff and as a program. And I had feedback from kids saying, you know, it was just really hard. We had kids crying after wins in the locker room. I didn't see that, but it happened after I got out of the locker room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were like 24 and five, but on the year we felt like it was 500 because uh, I think at times we were really wanting improvement by the kids. And then some kids were so disappointed. They didn't feel like they played enough. And so we talked about what can we do this year to prevent feeling like a loss at times instead of a win or what can we do as coaches and then how can we handle it if we have teammates that are really struggling after games you know so we brought up those tough conversations and the kids jumped in and said yeah I just we don't want to have that happen again this year and we want to be all in and we're going to be good teammates so they they watched it they didn't like how it felt the year before and they wanted to do what they could. And I think they were reaching out to us too of, can we try different things and can we talk and communicate more? I mean, that was one of the big reasons why we had more meetings. I felt like I didn't meet enough with the team the year before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, the best I can do is try and have more meetings and communicate more with the kids. And I think it really helped them the next year. Okay. I love that. And you know what, Coach, I'm going to give you some credit for that because I find that in my experience working with a lot of coaches to be a rare thing for high quality players to have. In my experience, high quality players who transition to be coaches sort of have expectations that everyone plays the game at the high level that they played it. Yeah. But they approach yeah. it in the same way. So they don't feel there's a burden to communicate. So it's like what no one had to tell me to be on time to practice. No one had to tell yeah. me to go yeah. hard at every rebound. So why should I have to tell them? And and so I'm always encouraging coaches to re, to remember that the craft of coaching is different than the craft of playing. Very the different. Playing, you're you're an audience of one. Take yep. care of your role. But the craft of coaching is you've got to adjust who you are as a leader for 15 different human beings. Mm -hmm. And each one of them gets the maximum of who they are pulled out in a different way. Right. So I say shout out to you that you've picked. I, I wrote that down as a note for myself that you cannot over communicate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to take that. I'm going to say it to as many coaches as I can. I think that's just awesome. Yeah. And I think, you know, keep sharing that with your staff of, Hey, and I know this on my, with my teams, I have different coaches that different kids feel more comfortable with, right? You see it for sure at the college level, but I want them to know, even if it's not me, you got to reach out to one of the coaches or your captains and keep that line of communication going. 
And you hope you're trying to build those leaders within your program, right? Um, but every year you're going to learn different things. And I've always said, if if I think I know it all, <laughs> I shouldn't be coaching anymore, right? Because you learn stuff every year you coach, and different coaches are going to help you on your staff. But you're you have a different dynamic every year you coach and different kids. So you have to be approachable, and you have to try to communicate the best you can, and then you try to open that door, whether it be on Saturdays or when, because you think you read kids, but you don't know what's going on, right? And some kids communicate better than others. So it's, some kids are very easy to come up and talk to you. And, you know, I've had a couple of kids where I feel like I've hardly gotten two words out of them in two years. So um, there's just that comfort level is different and you have to start it sometimes for them. 100%. 100%. Um, I love that. It sounds like, I mean, giving the accountability to the team, making sure they're just as as much a part of the ownership of the team's culture and the success. Like it's your team, it's your culture, own it. And I know that was in our, our uh, locker room all season when the girls had that signed. And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think yeah. the last thing I would add to that, and I talked about telling your coaches uh, to be approachable and, you know, communicate is be willing to get the feedback from the kids. You know, a lot of high schools, you will do end of the year evaluations, or if they don't, I hope your ADs are doing that for you and that you're listening to the feedback. You may not agree with it, um, but I, I do think when you communicate with the kids, you want to know how they're feeling. They need to try to share with you and you have to accept it if they're not doing OK or they, you know, they feel like you're being too hard or this coach is, you know, you're struggling with this coach. You have to have that conversation with that person on your staff or take a step back sometimes and think, how can I approach this differently? And how can I not um, be defensive when someone has told me uh, something and I perceive myself way different than that, right? Like, I feel like I had been really encouraging maybe to a kid and, and all they heard was the one negative thing I said or the one criticism. And so you have to learn from the feedback you get from the kids. And you guys know every athlete responds differently. Some kids you can get on hard some kids, uh, you have to watch how you say it or what you say. Um, so it's a constant adjustment, but you have to be an adult enough yourself to handle criticism and feedback from your athletes and not always take it personally, right? And think, how can I get better from this feedback? That's right. Absolutely. Leave our insecurities and our egos at the door. Yeah. Hey, don't say that word. You're going to have me talking all night. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I see the hour tick over there. Um, I know there's there's a lot of other AG, but I mean, this is exciting. Like everyone out there, Tara's going to be back. We have a lot of fun things um, that we're AGB is going to be doing with Tara Seifert. Um, and like the last thing I kind of want to close with, and, and for those out there watching and just kind of following Tara's journey, um, you know, you're beginning this new chapter, um, Creighton Durham. What a what are you looking forward to most with this with this new chapter of, of being like fully integrated into the school and like I, I'm loving like the focus they want you on like whole development and um, yeah hope, yeah what are you looking forward kind to of that? more student athlete welfare and development and more of an emphasis on the girl side of the female athletics at the school so I'm excited to work with all the female programs. Um, we're doing some community outreach. We're also, I'm working a lot with the captain's council that we have at our school. So getting all the captains together from the different sports, um, planning to bring some John Gordon stuff in with them as well. Um, but yeah, I'm just excited. Um, I'm hoping to make a positive impact and, you know, keep building. It's, it's a school that's had a lot of traditionally strong programs. They have hired a lot of new coaches in the last three or four years. So it's going to be fun to get to know what the different coaches do within their own programs. And then how can we be better as a school um, just to help strengthen all their programs. But, you know, my emphasis is a little bit more on the female side and I think get them up to the level they should be. Love that. I can't so wait I to get out there. Learn a lot along the way, but um, yeah, I, like I said, I love working with student athletes and coaches and um, I'm lucky that that gets to be my job right and get to coach along the way too absolutely and i um one of the articles that's put out there i i know wins and losses is not what it's about it's not about the outcomes um but at raiders haven't had uh, a winning season since 27 2018 
that's got to motivate you a little coach. Are, are we getting a winning season this year? Ah, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. But again, I got to sit down with the team and I'm getting to know the kids right now. And we're going to do a leadership book um, this fall. And I do feel like I have some good returners and kids. They, it's been fun. They're excited about a new leader. Uh, they're hard workers. They know they have some work to do, but it, it'll be fun to see their progress this year. So, you know, you can, you can um, focus on what you can and do your best and hopefully the wins will come. Absolutely. Results take care of themselves. I, I know we're a little bit over time, but we can't let coach out without our, our most, our most vulnerable question. The question uh -oh. we ask everyone at the, at the end, um, once you're nice and comfortable, <laughs> um, you know, so what, one of the things we're on a mission to do is to normalize in insecurity. Like we don't think it's a big deal. It's something that it's like, if you're hungry, you eat, if you're tired, you're sleep. And if you're insecure, what do you do? So what's your AGB? What's your next thing that you want to get better at your next step that that little voice in your head sometimes gets insecure about? Um, Hmm, that's great. I think we all have a lot of insecurities. I, you know, for me, it was a big step to take this new job because I was at a program that was doing really well and had built and kind of established. But I, you know, part of me is like, I want to try something new. Um, I love coaching and working with student athletes. And so for me, uh, I had some insecurities about changing what I had done. You get into a program and you get comfortable. And I knew if I tried something else, it would make me grow and get out of my comfort zone. And so I think for me, it's continuing to work on communication with coaches, but also parents. So parents of student athletes. Um, when I was a younger coach, it drove me nuts. I struggled talking to the parents. I always wanted to be a people pleaser. Um, I didn't sugarcoat things, but I avoided conflict. Um, and so I think as I've gotten older, I, I look at it more as I'm motivated to talk to maybe challenging parents and help them understand how they help their kids rather than be a roadblock for their kids or try to pave the way too much for their kids. So I think one of my um, goals is to get better at that and really look forward to tough meetings rather than dread them or avoid them. I don't know oh, if that's a good answer or not, but I hope I get better at it and become a really strong communicator with parents and not, not worry about when I'm meeting with a tough parent, uh, you know, just be open and honest and get to know them kind of like what we do with our program and our kids and just help them understand that we, we care and we're here to help your kids. And that um, as a parent of kids, that's what you want, right? You want, you want coaches that care about your kids are going to help develop your children because we all know that, a coach or a teacher can really put a positive impact on your child. That's right. That's right. Well, we'll we got to do an episode that's strictly um, dedicated to parents. We'll do that. We'll have coach come back on. <laughs> hope you'll come back yeah, on. I have time. some stories for you. <laughs> Just, <laughs> hopefully I'll have some good stories going forward too. But, you know, we, I joke with some other coaches about, how are the parents there? How's it going there? You know, and I think you get to a certain point and you're like, okay, you can do two things. You can complain about parents or you can learn to communicate and, and deal with them and help them grow. And so I've tried to make this shift of, I'm not going to worry about a confrontation. I want to have a conversation and, and come to a common ground and help them understand that coaches are here because they care about your kids and we're trying to help your child and um, get them on board with what you're trying to do. Love that. Coaches are here because they care about your kids. Yeah. Sound bite that. Put that on the Instagram reel. <laughs> Coach, Coach T, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for it. having me. I'm so excited for you guys, and um, I hope this explodes. So you, you got a lot of things going in the right direction, and I love that you're putting this all online and creating these opportunities for coaches and kids and parents. So I appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Well, yeah, we appreciate you. Right back at you, Coach. All Until right. next time.